the sun reached its maximum depression at about 2.30 p.m. on the 22nd, Greenwich Mean Time. This is 2.30 a.m. on the 23rd, according to the local time of the 180th meridian, which we are keeping. Dinner tonight is therefore the meal which is nearest the sun's critical change of course, and has been observed with all the festivity customary at Christmas at home. At tea we broached an enormous buzzard cake, with much gratitude to its provider, Cherry Garra. In preparation for the evening, our Union Jacks and sledge flags were hung about the large table, which itself was laid with glass and a plentiful supply of champagne bottles instead of the customary mugs and enamel lime juice jugs. At seven o'clock we sat down to an extravagant bill of fare as compared with our usual simple diet. Beginning on seal soup, by common consent the best decoction that our cook produces, we went on to roast beef with Yorkshire pudding, fried potatoes and Brussels sprouts. Then followed a flaming plum pudding and excellent mince pies, and thereafter a dainty savoury of anchovy and cod's row. A wondrous attractive meal, even in so far as judged by our simple lights, but with its garnishments a positive feast, for with all the table was strewn with dishes of burnt almonds, crystallised fruits, chocolates, and such toothsome kickshaws, whilst the unstinted supply of champagne which accompanied the courses was succeeded by a noble array of liquor bottles from which choice could be made in the drinking of toasts. I screwed myself up to a little speech which drew attention to the nature of the celebration as a halfway mark, not only in our winter, but in the plans of the expedition as originally published. I fear there are some who don't realise how rapidly time passes and who have barely begun work which by this time ought to be in full swing. We had come through a summer season and half a winter, and had before us half a winter and a second summer. We ought to know where we stood in every respect. We did know how we stood in regards to stores and transport, and I especially thank the officer in charge of stores and the custodians of the animals. I said that as regards the future, chance must play a part, but that experience showed me that it would have been impossible to have chosen people more fitted to support me in the enterprise to the south than those who were to start in that direction in the spring. I thanked them all for having put their shoulders to the wheel and given me this confidence. We drank to the success of the expedition. Then everyone was called on to speak, starting on my left and working round the table. The result was very characteristic of the various individuals. One seemed to know so well the style of utterance to which each would commit himself. Needless to say, all were entirely modest and brief. Unexpectedly, all had exceedingly kind things to say of me. In fact, I was obliged to request the omission of compliments at an early stage. Nevertheless, it was gratifying to have a really genuine recognition of my attitude towards the scientific workers of the expedition, and I felt very warmly towards all those kind, good fellows for expressing it. If goodwill and happy fellowship count towards success, very surely we shall deserve to succeed. It was a matter of a comment much applauded that there had not been a single disagreement between any two members of our party from the beginning. By the end of dinner, a very cheerful spirit prevailed, and the room was cleared for Ponting and his lantern, whilst the gramophone gave forth its most lively airs. When the table was upended, its legs removed, and chairs arranged in rows, we had quite a roomy lecture hall. Ponting had cleverly chosen this opportunity to display a series of slides made from his own local negatives. I have never so fully realised his work as on seeing those beautiful pictures. They so easily outclass anything of their kind previously taken in these regions. Our audience cheered vociferously. After the show, the table was restored for Snapdragon, and a brew of milk punch was prepared in which we drank the health of Campbell's party and of our good friends in the Terra Nova. Then the table was again removed, and a set of lancers formed. By this time, the effect of stimulating liquid refreshment on men so long accustomed to a simple life became apparent. Our biologist had retired to bed, the silent soldier bubbled with humour and insisted on dancing with Anton, Evans, P.O., was imparting confidences in heavy whispers. Pat Keohan had grown intensely Irish and desirous of political argument, while Clissold sat with a constant expansive smile and punctuated the babble of conversation with an occasional whoop of delight or disjointed witticism. Other bright-eyed individuals merely reached the capacity to enjoy that which under ordinary circumstances might have passed without evoking a smile. In the midst of the reverie, Bowers suddenly appeared, followed by some satellites bearing an enormous Christmas tree whose branches bore flaming candles, gaudy crackers and little presents for all. The presents, I learned, had been prepared with kindly thought by Miss Super, 
Mrs. Wilson's sister, and the tree had been made by bowers of pieces of stick and string with coloured paper to clothe its branches. The whole erection was remarkably creditable, and the distribution of the presents caused much amusement. Whilst revelry was the order of the day within our hut, the elements without seemed desirous of celebrating the occasion with equal emphasis and greater decorum. The eastern sky was massed with swaying auroral light, the most vivid and beautiful display that I had ever seen. Fold on fold the arches and curtains of vibrating luminosity rose and spread across the sky to slowly fade and yet again spring to glowing life. The brighter light seemed to flow, now to mass itself in wreathing folds in one quarter, from which lustrous streamers shot upwards, and anon to run in waves through the system of some dimmer figure, as if to infuse new life within it. It is impossible to witness such a beautiful phenomenon without a sense of awe, and yet this sentiment is not inspired by its brilliancy, but rather by its delicacy in light and colour, its transparency, and above all by its tremulous evanescence of form. There is no glittering splendour to dazzle the eye, as has been too often described. Rather, the appeal is to the imagination by the suggestion of something wholly spiritual, something instinct, with a fluttering ethereal life, serenely confident, yet restlessly mobile. One wonders why history does not tell us of aurora worshippers. So easily could the phenomenon be considered the manifestation of God or demon. To the little silent group which stood at gaze before such enchantment, it seemed profane to return to the mental and physical atmosphere of our house. Finally, when I stepped within, I was glad to find that there had been a general movement bedwards, and in the next half hour the last of the roisterers had succumbed to slumber. Thus, except for a few bad heads in the morning, ended the high festival of midwinter.